Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labucan with the Rocks and Stocks News, and uh, we've got one of our sponsors on today in uh, you and Downey with I eighty Gold. Before I get started, I got to do the disclosure that uh, I eighty is a sponsor. Keep that in mind. I'm biased. Uh, I do these shows for the benefit when I with sponsors, but I also do it for the benefit of my my viewers. And um, the bottom line is, I whether a company is a sponsor or a pick, they go through the same uh, same filters. And uh, when I look through the filters at I eighty Gold, I see a company with a very bright future. Uh, Ewan, thanks a lot for do joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me on again. It's been a while since we talked, so looking forward to catching up. Well, you've been a busy guy. You raised one hundred and fifteen million dollars, uh, and uh, that could put you in a good position to crank up the drills and uh, get a lot of news out, I understand. Yes, it definitely puts us in a very uh, strong position starting the year, because essentially for us now, this is starting 2024. Uh, we're in a much better financial position than, than we were going into 2023. And as everybody knows, and I'm sure you're aware, the, the mining environment has been quite uh, quite subdued. And 23 was one of the worst years, I think, on record for developers and explorers. And the ability to raise capital was was very difficult. And so throughout 2023, we were less and less aggressive at how we were advancing our projects. And I don't think we hit, we, we didn't hit several of the targets we'd set for the company in 23, mainly because we didn't have the balance sheet to do it. And with this uh, financing, it puts us in a very strong position to be able to accelerate the programs that we didn't do last year and start to publish the feasibility studies and the other uh, advanced uh, studies that we will require, we believe, uh, for the market to give us more credit for what we've uh, we put together here in Nevada. Well, things are starting to get better. 23 was a difficult year, but 24, especially just before the PDAC, things have started to uh, get hot for the price of gold. As of yet, you know, it's not, not the same story for the gold stocks. But I think that there's a narrative that, you know, gold has a potential to go much higher. You know, you, you and usually in my commentary, I try to stay a, a year ahead and look only a year ahead. And I, I recently did a bunch of math on, on what I see happening with the price of gold. And people may think I'm crazy, but I actually think we could see $20,000 gold in the next uh, 10 years. And the basics, basis for that argument is that I think the death spiral of debt is putting governments in a position where they have to return to the gold standard and then you've also got that they are they are in a big way divesting themselves of U.S. dollars and U.S. debt. They're turning towards gold as the I think going to be a major player in reserve currencies, and also as a major player in um, in world trade. For all those things to happen, gold has to go a lot higher. Now that's a very bullish comment that I made, but. I do think that even if I'm only a fraction correct, that uh, we'll we'll have a very good market for gold and gold stocks. What do you think? Oh, I, I can't agree with you more. I, I'm not sure I'm going to be out there saying I think it's going to twenty thousand dollars an ounce. I certainly hope so. It'll be uh, be a great great market for for mining companies if that's the case. But I I, I think we've seen a, a really strong. Obviously, we're at all time high gold prices now. We haven't seen the reaction in the stocks. That's either through, a, I believe, either a non-belief or probably as likely that investors have just been able for the last few years to stick it in the S&P and you're guaranteed a return. So it's it's pulled money away from our sector. But uh, you're, I think you're ahead of the curve, Alan, on the, on the death spiral of debt, the debt that Canada and the U.S. and you know, these Western countries are taking on to keep the the engine running, so to speak, is crazy. And with the interest rates elevated, that's just making it worse. The, you know, I think Canada, I read recently, 
is spending more on servicing the debt than they are, we are in healthcare. No wonder our healthcare is so terrible. Um, and and it, how long can this go on that the debt just goes up and up and people don't care? So I, I think you're ahead of the curve. It is going to come to roost and gold's doing what it's supposed to do right now. It, it's going up and it's going to go up more. Uh, you because know, when of you this. look at it at a debt to gold backing, the U.S. only owns about 1% or 2% of gold relative to their debt. That, to me, is ludicrous. I, I mean, what is backing it? The, po the promise that they'll pay or that they can crank up the, 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 uh, the um, printing press on cash? It, it has no basis in, in real economics. And I think that's ultimately why the world is going to return to a gold standard. Yeah, definitely. There's no printing press for gold. And um, it also gold has no political attachment. It's a it's a currency unlike any other. And we see the central bank buying is getting stronger and stronger as they're starting to give give up or sell the U.S. dollar or U.S. backing of their, um, I guess, in in their reserves. And they're putting gold in its place. And, they, and we're seeing that more and more countries are doing it. And if you look back in the early 2000s to uh, beyond 2010, all the central banks were selling. Now, the majority of the central banks are buying, and there's a reason for that. And like I said, I think you've been ahead of the curve on that one, Alan. And the, the world reserve currency, we're down to now it's less than 60% US dollar backing as a world reserve currency. We haven't seen this since 1995. Yeah, I I think we're in we're in a good place. It's just now how do we convent how how do we get the investors to come back into buying the stocks? I think what we've seen is with this gold price rise. If you look back in 2022, we had gold go up. Remember, touch 2000, all the stocks were moving. Uh, we were we were over four dollars at the time and all time highs. It was it was pretty good times for the sector. Um, here we are, we went past 2000 and well beyond that. And yet only some of the major producers have moved. The developers are still kind of stuck. The small tier mining companies haven't moved that much. If you look at Orla Mining as an example, they haven't really participated in this rise like you'd think they should. They haven't done like what the Alamos and the Agnicos have done. So it usually is a, is a trickle down effect. When the generalists start to come in, they buy the, I guess, the safest ones, which are the big producers. And once those sort of run out of steam, then they start to go down the food chain. And ultimately, that will lead to the explorers. So I, I think it's a good time to look at some of these companies that have been dropped to 10 cents or less even, who have good assets that should get financed and move forward, uh, because those, those companies will 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 be the bottom of the food chain when it starts, but probably get some of the best returns. So it's you guys I think it's a good time. The middle straddling both. You've got the development and you've got the exploration. And um we're all, we're all already starting to see some consolidation in the juniors. Uh there was just an announcement today West Red Lake Gold uh is uh is merging with another uh, trilogy, I think. Um, so we're starting to see some of that that um, that consolidation in the juniors, the explorers. So I, I agree. I think that uh, we need to attract more. And now you've got the cash to do the work that tends to attract investors. So why don't we talk about that, you? And that's the my favorite subject with your company because you have such great group of assets. I, yeah, I'd, I'd say that we really slowed down the pace of advancement going into the end of 23 and for sure even more here in the in the first quarter of 24, mainly because our balance sheet was getting lower and lower. And um, so so solving that was really critical for us to get back to work, so to speak. And um and we we do have some drill results still to come from finishing programs up in 23 and early 24. So we're expecting some pretty good 
results to be coming down the pipe here soon, but the pace of what how we were working had significantly slowed because we were, uh, you know, we we're watching our balance sheet. And, and with this uh, injection, we're moving multiple drills back in the Granite Creek. At Granite Creek, we intended to do a pretty significant drill campaign last year, both from underground and surface, in order to upgrade uh, a significant amount of the resource that we've uh, identified or the new deposit we've identified in the South Pacific zone into measured and indicated to publish a feasibility study. And we we didn't get that. We did a small surface drill program, great results. We did some underground drilling. Uh, I think the National Bank analysts note um, that on the back of that release was that the average grade of our underground drilling so far is over 20 grams per ton. And um, so getting back to getting that deposit drilled off properly to move into a full feasibility study and that that will position us to start to look at conventional bank debt, which would be better than doing the prepays and the streams and stuff like that as a, as a means to grow our company. So it's the first real critical study we want to publish is the one on Granite Creek. We stopped drilling at Cove where we've been having fabulous results uh, just to save uh, save capital. Before and we get on to Cove, um, at Granite Creek, I see some pretty exciting stuff. That, that South Pacific zone is getting bigger as you go to the north. The grades are coming up um, and uh, not too far away to the north in the same rocks, in the same structure is a 25 million ounce uh, gold mine. So you've got a long runway there uh, to keep on expanding at the South Pacific zone. And South Pacific has to be one of the best undeveloped gold projects in North America. Yeah, we we think so, for sure. It's uh, our, our furthest north hole that we've drilled to date in the South Pacific zone was 15.6 uh, or 15.7 grams, over 6.6 .6 meters. So it remains wide open. Uh, we're going to start following up on that here shortly and, and hopefully expanding out to the north. There's an old homestake hole and a further 500 meters to the north that hit two high grade zones. So we, we believe the structure runs significantly further north. And then there's another mile or 1.6 kilometers from that hole to the boundary of Turquoise Ridge that is essentially completely untested. So we see the upside at Granite Creek to be, be mass, potentially massive. Uh, like you said, we're sitting right beside on strike from a 25 million ounce mine, one of the biggest gold mines in North America. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, we expect it to yield a lot of good results and it will become our first producing center for the company. We have, even though we are doing some mining there, test mining, et cetera, we have never just declared a commercial uh, production decision because we haven't had the feasibility study. So now that's going to allow us to elevate that project. And Can you tell um, us a little bit about that test mining. What is the goal of that? And what are you learning from that, Ewan? Well, as we're going down to the South Pacific zone, we're going through the OG zone. So mining the OG zone brings some capital back into us as we're getting down to the South Pacific zone. Um, so it's it's really, and, and what we're establishing is what is the right mining method for this operation? A lot of people do feasibility studies based on computer uh, models. models. West Red Lake, um, you know, the previous owners there, Madsen was a, was a good example of, you know, you did a bunch of drilling from surface. You you said, here's what the mine looks like. The feasibility study looked pretty good. They went underground and it didn't quite pan out. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're able to demonstrate, yes, we can pull the grade out of these deposits. We can get the tons we need out of each, each stope. And now we want to do the same in South Pacific is put in initial workings, establish what is the best mining method. We, we'd love if we could long hole mine. It would bring our mining costs down and our profit up. But, you know, let's prove that that works before we put it into a study. So we'd like to put in the development here in the probably in the third quarter to get initial stopes. We were hoping to do it in the second quarter, but now probably the third quarter will be the initial stopes. Establish what is the right mining method. Make sure the ground conditions are such that it is going to mine successfully and then finish the drilling and do the feasibility study. Uh, and on the back of that, that feasibility study will have real life costs in it. So you're, you're what we're you're, hoping. 
you're doing that not just a bank a feasible feasibility study, but you're really protecting yourself against a horror show uh, and getting it mined that you know you're not you're going to avoid those problems of some of these projects that get rushed into production and they all turn out to be a disaster when that happens. Yeah, and we'd like to do the same at, uh, at Ruby Hill ultimately, uh, once we get the underground permits and get going on that program, is do the test mining first as part of the definition underground drilling, also do the mining method establishment before we publish a feasibility study. So it's based on real world costs. Real We've cost. established this mining cost work. This is exactly what it's costing us today to mine a ton at, uh, you know, using that mining method, and that'll be implemented into our studies. So it should be quite accurate studies, to 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 be frank. And some and of then, those studies out there are not that accurate. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and 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 by that time, the underground development, the new uh, dewatering well we've already put in, the ventilation will be put in. So the capital required to get to that full production would is probably a month or two and very minimal. So we're expecting an internal rate of return that's going to be sort of off the charts when we publish it. Um, I like and, the sounds of that. I interrupted you on the coves. Why don't you get into Cove now for us, Ewan? Well, Cove, we, we, you know, we've been having world-class intercepts there. That's, that's really our anchor, our, our top gold project is what we expect will be our top gold project is Cove. And we put in the underground development in 23, mid 23, we finished the phase one development. We put a drill in, we wanted to have two or three going, but we only put one in because as I said earlier, our balance sheet and going into this program, we're moving a, a drill back in and probably two. So we're actually gonna start accelerating Cove towards feasibility. Um, whereas we were slowing down and Cove uh, results of, you know, I'm sure we've, we've talked about them a few times on your show of being uh, world-class up to 30 meters, consistently 10 to 30 gram mineralization. And we expect that it is going to be our, our top gold asset in our portfolio. And, you know, it really checks those boxes that you and I off camera when we talk about other projects have often talked about the importance of continuity. Uh, you know, that's really king. It's not just grade, it's the combination of grade and continuity that are king. And uh, that's what stands out for me on both uh, Granite Creek as well as uh, Cove is the continuity of that high grade. Yeah, both projects are displaying great continuity within the primary ore zones or primary mineralized zones. So it's uh, it's it's working out well in that regard. Uh, next will be Ruby Hill, but Ruby Hill is a bit of a different beast of a gold deposit. It's a much bigger, uh, more of a bulk mining uh, scenario than the sort of uh, vein or flat lying structures that we're seeing at the other projects and in places true widths up to 70 meters. But grades of six to 10 grams of, of that material. So it's it's a really, really good gold deposit, wide open. We only drilled one step out hole at Ruby Hill in gold last year, and we hit over 50 meters of 6.9 grams. So the deposit remains wide open uh, to the south from that intercept. And then there's all the polymetallics we've been delineating. And and uh, in our last On few the holes- the side of things, Ewan, what would be a- ballpark uh, cutoff grade um i know you can't be too specific because you haven't got all the inputs but in nevada for something like that a loose uh cutoff grade might be if we had the autoclave sitting right beside ruby hill it would probably be around three grams i would think probably stockpile some lower grade material than that but some around three grams would probably be a good cutoff grade because Ruby Hill, we have to truck all the way up to Lone Tree. Um, I would think that when we ultimately publish our our feasibility model or our next resource on that, uh, we'll probably use four to four and a half grams. We need that extra gram, gram and a half for and that a extra lot of trucking. Those drill holes give you some window there of a couple, two, three grams, and that could make for a nice IRR. Yeah, and we haven't even uh, we discovered in late twenty two. 
we hit a deeper zone we call the 428 zone that was 12 over 12 grams per ton over more than 10 meters and we haven't even started following up that the, that discovery and we we do think that is going to be maybe not a big deposit but where it's located it should be another identical structure of what was mined in the pit and it's open and uh, a long strike and and widthwise it'll be a flat lying structure but it is completely open there's only two holes that have tested that structure and both return better than 12 grams per ton so we're we there's a lot of upside at ruby hill um, deposits open to the north open to the south on the gold front and then of course we've uh, we spent the last year of our drilling uh, going into the end of last year and early this year drilling the polymetallic discoveries we made five different polymetallic discoveries along the hilltop fault structure. And that structure is completely open at this point. Our southmost hole, I believe we hit 114 meter intercept of polymetallic mineralization that really opens up the deposit to the south. And uh, we're working through all the innuendos of bringing in a partner that we've announced that we intend to bring a partner into Ruby Hill. Um, and once we work through the different components to that joint venture agreement. It's a pretty complex agreement uh, because of offtakes, uh, refractory ore would go to Lone Tree. What are the processing costs? Because we won't do that for free for the joint venture. All those things we have to work through in order to get, uh, get, get across the line. But uh, we're waiting to get back drilling there. And the, the plan would be as soon as that uh, JV is, is formalized or uh, what we expect will be formalized, is at that point, we will do a very major drill campaign to expand resources, publish the initial resources for Blackjack, FAD, and Hilltop. So we expect that to be a pretty significant increase in our resource base. And um, we're eagerly, uh, uh, well, we're working, uh, working diligently to try to bring that deal together the, in a structure that works for both parties. And um, uh, benefits the property going forward. It really is a tremendous property. You've got the CRDs, you've got the high grade, you've got the SCARNs, you've got the Carlin uh, deposits, and you have an asset there that you hardly even talk about, but it kind of makes me think of what happened with Equinox at their uh, at their Greenstone project that you guys uh, are the ones that found and moved forward and now and when with Premier Gold, and the, when that was spun out uh, or when taken over, the shareholders of Premier got shares in Equinox and in uh, and in uh, I80 Gold, and now Equinox has built and is about to turn on a mine, and they bought the other forty percent that they didn't have because you guys own sixty percent of it at Premier, and. Uh, it looks like it's now going to become one of Canada's biggest mines. And you guys brought that from nothing to now it's going to be one of Canada's biggest mines. And it just goes to show the qual that you guys are always focused on quality and moving those projects forward. Why don't you touch a little bit on, you know, I guess you can give yourself a pat, your, you and your team a pat on the back for Greenstone. Yeah, Greenstone's just uh, ramping up. They're uh, commissioning, they've commissioned the mill, they're running material through it. And should be pretty soon, we we hear from Equinox that they've had their first gold pour. So looking forward to seeing that. It's a project that we started, uh, the concept came up probably in the early 2000s. We spent many years trying to buy it from uh, Barrick, uh, the project, because they owned it and they were just sitting on it. And in 2008, we embarked on the drill program where we thought there could be uh, kind of like a, um, uh, a the Cisco um, Canadian Malarctic deposit. It was a very similar geological setting as that sitting here uh, just north of our, our office where I'm sitting today. And thought was there could be a very similar deposit sitting right on the Trans-Canada Highway there. And so that that was something we spent a lot of years trying to buy. Our our theory that there could be an open pit is obviously was was right. We drilled it off, we permitted it, and then we were taken over. Um, and Equinox and Orion built it. And you know, as we were talking about before the show, 
Orion, or Equinox just announced that they're buying Orion's 40% of that project for a billion US, essentially a billion US. And between underground and open pit resources, that's for 3 million ounces. Uh, I-80 Gold has, uh, you know, more than six, six and a half, about six and a half million ounces measured and indicated, 8 million ounces inferred. So combined over 14 and a half million ounces of gold resources. And within that is the mineral point deposit at Ruby Hill. Um, it's not in our corporate presentation on the website, but if you do some work, there's some old presentations that have it. And it's a same size gold deposit as Greenstone uh, sitting on Ruby Hill. It's an oxide heap leach project. It's a big one that's going to be pretty big capital and is something that we intend to move into pre-fees and feasibility probably five years from now. But I think if we said we're building three underground mines and a big open pit in Nevada, people would think we're really crazy. So we we put that on the back burner for now, but it is a, a, a greenstone size project that we're just sitting on in Nevada. And, and another thing we never talk about is that Lone Tree, there are refractory or, you know, sulfide deposits sitting around Lone Tree that we're just sitting on right now. Um, they've got great grades, good widths. And um, we've got several of these really good exploration prospects in our portfolio that we we don't even uh, carry in our presentation, but could be co company builders on their own. And, you know, Ewan, we've talked about this issue of Nevada, where it's going in the future for mining, as the last 50 years have pretty much you know, if you want to keep mining oxide deposits in Nevada, there just really aren't very many of them. Anglo's doing that thing at Silicon that looks quite spectacular. Um, but what else is there? And, and you guys have an oxide uh, deposit that uh, may be attractive to some companies that uh, want to keep mining oxides in, in Nevada. Yeah, it is a uh, it's something that we've been approached about before. We've had discussions about, you know, how do we advance that project right now? And and if you recall, uh, Paycor before we acquired FAD, they did some drilling on the upper parts of that FAD deposit and have had some really good intercepts of oxide mineralization well over a gram over good widths, and that has yet to be followed up. So there we we do have oxide targets in addition to our sulfide targets in terms of gold. And um, right now we're trying to figure out how do we, we haven't done any brass roots exploration since we found the hilltop zone almost two years ago. So with all the development heavy portion of our company's uh, kind of history going on right now, it's how do we continue to exploration? As you know, I'm a, I'm an explorationist at heart. So we're we're thinking of different uh, different means that maybe we could resume exploration. You know, do we bring in other partners? To, uh, so we're we're looking at how do we continue to to stay involved in exploration. There's some good greenfield exploration targets. We have large land packages in the heart of the Carlin Battle Mountain trends, and a lot of these properties have. We made two discoveries at at Cove that. Um, should be followed up, but we're not following them up. Uh, one of them was a five gram gold, 410 gram silver and over 10% lead zinc intercept. And we, it's just sitting there all by itself still. So we, we've got some really compelling targets to look for other deposits on our properties. And we're, we're trying to figure out how to do that because, you know, in, in the junior sector, the small cap company often expiration successes are what really drive share prices and we want to uh we want to continue to make sure that expiration is a part of our our lifeblood as uh, as a company well you know i like your your you and me love the exploration but i also like your vision of what's happening in nevada you and and the efforts that you're making to be moving into that future um, we've talked in the past about the oxides, how, you know, a lot of those have been found and what does a company do if they want to keep mining oxides in, in Nevada, they got to go underground or 
if they want to keep mining gold in Nevada, they got to start looking at the sulfides. And you're really, your company is one of the, the leaders in moving in that direction uh, towards the sulfides. And, you know, ultimately, I think that's going to make I-80 a pretty attractive Nevada gold mining company. Yes, with the acquisition of Lone Tree, we are one of only three companies in Nevada, and I believe only one of three companies in all of the United States that has a facility capable of processing refractory ore. And in Nevada, over the last 20 years, the majority of production has moved from being oxide or heap leach, mainly heap leach operations, to today where most of the production for Nevada gold mines comes from sulfide mineralization. And most good deposits in the state are oxide near surface where they've been oxide by, na by nature over millions and millions of years, tens of millions of years. And as you go to depth, they become sulfide. And most companies stop drilling as soon as they hit sulfide. So we're, we're out there when we hear of somebody hit a high grade sulfide intercept, or if we hear of somebody, you can be sure that within 24 hours, somebody in our company will make a phone call and say, okay, can we look at what you hit? Because <laughs> we're definitely looking for deposits that will help us fill that facility for a long, long time and ensure a long, long future to this company. Whereas if you don't have one of these facilities, once you run out of oxides, you're done. And um, so I think that's one of the big competitive advantages that we have in the state that gets overlooked often. Well, you know, you and we went through a tough year in 2023. Now that you're in 2024 and raised a bunch of money, I, I think you'll, you'll, you're you're going to get excited about gold moving higher and all the work that you guys are going to get to do. So I think that's going to lead to a lot of uh, exciting stuff through the drill bit and with news flow from your company. Yeah, we're we're very excited. To get, I'm I'm very excited for us to get back to work. Uh, very excited about, you know, step out drilling. Um, Matt Geely and our team in Nevada take care of the operational side. And I, uh, I work with Tyler uh, mainly in advancing exploration, building our answers, um, work with Matt Golad on the strategy side of the business. Uh, but as we've known each other for a long time, and as you know, I really like the finding of deposits, being involved in that discovery, the excitement of a discovery is is what really drives me in this industry. And we'll, uh, that'll be something that'll continue to be a big focus for me personally. Well, it's it's a big focus for me too, you and, and I, I told you before the show that I recently became a pretty significant shareholder for me in I-80. And uh, I'm sort of putting my money where my mouth is and I bought the stock and I bought Warren. So uh, go out there and make a bunch of good news. I, I and uh, uh, I, I, I'm pretty bad, glad I've been able to uh, take a significant position for me. Okay, well, good, good to hear that. I, uh, I participate in this financing like I have in every one, and I increased again my share ownership in this company. And uh, there's nothing more than I want for this company to be a major success and become the next Alamos Gold. I like the sounds of that. They're a low-cost producer and one of my favorite uh, picks in the mining space for low-cost producers. So uh, keep going in that direction, you and and I'll I'll be you and I will be happy happy shareholders. Yep, sounds good, Al. All Thanks right, I'm gonna close it off, you and. Yep, thank you. So there you go, folks. Um, I80 Gold is uh, is now cashed up in a big way. I think the fact that they were able to raise over a hundred million dollars is a in a in a challenging market uh, is indicative of the quality of their projects. Uh, you know, raising 10, 20 million has been pretty challenging. Doing 115 million is a, a reflection of the quality of their projects. And uh, and and I, I I'm pretty bullish on where they're gonna grow into. Uh, in the future. But of course, do your homework, speak with your financial advisors, have a great day, and we will talk to you soon.